I'm always inspired by saints who have a conversion experience. It's nice to read about saints who were born and their first words were, I love Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. That's nice. Um, I find that kind of a little hard to relate to because uh, I think for most of us, we grow up and then have to, there's, there's a point where you have to kind of decide for the faith or discover the faith or rediscover the faith or something has to be kind of maybe broken in order for us to, 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 to open to what the Lord is, is willing to offer us. So uh, when we hear about saints who got it wrong and then converted or, or discovered the faith, I think it's a little, probably a little closer to most of our experience. So you think of your, your St. Francis, for example, you know, vain and uh, so relatively wealthy and then comes back, in, comes back to his home village in shame after losing a battle after all his fine armor and that you know, didn't serve him much. And uh, he realized maybe like, is, is, is this it? Is this it? And uh, so on and so forth. Won't go into that story because he's not the saint of the day. Uh, but you think of your uh, uh, St. Teresa of Avila as well, who during her 40s, early 40s, 42 or three, she has this rediscovery of her vocation and realizes that, that the way she was living her vocation, it was, I mean, it was okay. It was all right. It wasn't heretical. It wasn't satanic. It wasn't evil. It just wasn't holy. You know, it was passable. It was maybe kind of sufficient. You know, you get your kind of 65% or whatever. So it's okay, like, it's not awful. But it's definitely not what God was calling her to. Uh, and, you know, you think of St. Peter, to go back, back a, a, a 15 centuries. Uh, back to, 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 to St. Peter himself, who walking with the Lord didn't get things right all the time. And even with the best of intentions at times, Lord, thou shalt not go to Jerusalem. Get behind me, Satan, says Jesus to him. So with the best of intentions, Lord, I want to protect your life. I don't want you to suffer. Don't, you can't go to Jerusalem. They want to kill you. So, but he gets it wrong, betraying Jesus and so on and so forth. And I find, I find that's in some way a little more relatable to, to, to our experience, because we don't get it right all the time. Uh, and that's frustrating, because often we know what we're supposed to do, and we don't get there. We know what the mark is, we know what the bar is, and we don't get there. Now, it's already such a gift to know where the bar is, because very often, unfortunately, especially today, the, the actual religious bar is so low that people, most people think they've already superseded it. You know, most people think all you have to do is believe in God. I already do that, so voila, done. Everything else is a bonus. You know, I give money to charity as well, and I help in a soup kitchen. And I saw a cat stuck in a tree, and I helped that cat down. So, I mean, I'm way above the norm here. Because if, if that's where the bar is, ridiculously low, all you have to do is believe in God, believe that God exists, well, then sure, we're all way above that. Great, job done. Just that's actually not where the bar is. That's not what we're called to. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be as perfect as God. That's the bar, which is, I can't even see it, <laughs> right? It's so high up there, it's astronomical. Be as perfect as God. So it's just, it, it, the bar is very, very high, and that's good. Anything worthwhile has a high bar. Anything that's, you know, if, if it doesn't matter, fine. Turn, turn up and we'll give you a, a gold star for attendance and you can pass. Whoopie do. You will never frame that gold star because it means nothing to you. Whereas the thing that you've had to fight for and bleed for, the thing that you've maybe failed in attaining, then you have to get up again and push on. That's worth something to you. So at St. Ignatius, a, a similarly, a little similar to, to, to St. Francis, is quite a vain character. Um, used to love wearing his armor even when there was no fight. In other words, like, well, it's like just, and, and you have your, your breastplate, like maybe have your, your family's coat of arms and all this kind of stuff, and you'd walk around, you have your sword, see my sword, it's my sword, I have my dagger just in case. Uh, you're going out to buy milk. Um, you know, but just making sure everyone saw I've got my gear on because I'm a soldier. Uh, so just, and he, he just reveled in it. And it, it, it was that time period as well, into the, 15th century into the 16th century of, of knights and chivalry and all that kind of thing. Uh, but there was, there was an awful lot of vanity there. And so on one occasion then in the Basque region of Spain, uh, there, were, there was a bit of a contested land there with France. And so in he went into battle 
uh, very courageous and uh, very uh, dedicated to the cause, um, but he got hit by a cannonball. Now, that's, that's not something I can even imagine. Like, a ball, yay big, traveling at any speed, even if someone just kind of pushed it against you, that would be sufficient. Uh, but a cannonball roaring at you shattered one leg and broke the other. So he just left on the battlefield going, what good is my armor now? Uh, so he was, you know, shattered one leg and broke the other. So he, the guy was in a bad way. Apparently, actually, the French brought him home, seeing his courage. Maybe he was lying on the ground, still flailing his sword, I don't know. But the French saw his courage, and so inspired were they by his courage, they actually said, where are you from? Loyola. So they brought him home. Okay. Uh, so while in bed at home, uh, this was the, the, the era of the, the, the beginnings of the, uh, the printing press. So for the first time ever, uh, books could be reproduced quickly and an awful lot more cheaply than writing them by hand. So when he was lying on, in bed, bored out of his brain, he said, look, is there anything to read there? And he, he looked for romance novels. Now, they couldn't find any. What could they find? Well, mainly religious books, because the, the, the church had its acts together uh, as regards printing. So he came across a book, The Life of Christ, which he read from cover to cover. And then he started reading about the lives of saints. And something clicked. It's like this, this moment of grace where in his weakness, in his brokenness, he sees that saints are game changers, that saints are, are, are a kind of soldier that make so much more of a difference than swinging a sword, that saints are game changers and saints are, are, are true spiritual soldiers. And this sets something off in his mind that, that that's what I want to do. I want to make a difference, but not just for some fleeting piece of territory which belongs to Spain, France, who really cares at the end of the day? Well, I shouldn't say that, but uh, at the end of the day, these, these boundaries are going to change sometime anyway. What, what, what difference can I make? Whereas you save a soul, that's saved for all eternity. So maybe this is the battle I should be fighting. And it just, that, that, that conviction just stuck with him. The battle for souls, that's what matters. The fight for souls. That's, that's, that's what really, that's the only thing that really ultimately matters because it matters for all eternity. And so this conviction grew and his spiritual wisdom grew and then with, uh, he felt the call to priesthood and with a group of seminarians then starts the Society of Jesus, then became known as the Jesuits. And what he's probably most famous for uh, in our day, is the spiritual exercises. So traditionally, a 30-day retreat, most people can't do 30 days, but um, a, a retreat of, of 30 days broken into three main sections. Uh, three main sections that, that many of the spiritual greats uh, of, of, of recent centuries uh, follow. It's the, the, the first section or the first part of, of the retreat. It's what they call the, the purgative way. So from the Latin word purgare in Italian, pur, in, in Latin meaning to, to purify, to purge. So purge in English has a very negative connotation, uh, but in, in, it means to, to purify, to empty, to clean. So, to, so the purgative way, to, to, to clean oneself. So sin, the issue of sin, the problem of evil, the issue of sin, my sin, the consequences of my sin to recognize what my sin is and how far my sin goes back and the, the, the reasons for my sin and why do I keep doing this? And what are my, are my habits uh, that, that, that are sinful? What do I do that leads me away from God? And then as such, following his typical kind of soldier mentality, to declare war on it, that's enough, stop, stop. If I see this, this, this are, are bad habits, bad places, people who lead me to sin, cut it, cut it off. How long do you want to keep playing around with this? Like, if it's, if it's not working, if this, if this endangers your soul, cut it off. And to, to be very clear in this, uh, normally, uh, say, a week during the retreat, in which we, we, we recognize that this need to, to purify ourselves, purify our hearts, cut off the, the, the sinful habits, and start to, to enter more into, into an ever greater reliance on the Lord. So week two, then, is the illuminative way. So the... the the way in which now we recognize ever deeper now my need for God, prayer life, a, a, a depth of, of reliance on God, regular prayer, 
what prayer is, how prayer works, that the habit of prayer, all of, all of that. So we're kind of for first part is cutting off all that's that's dragging me down the whole sin bit. But we don't want to dwell excessively on sin because it's all, it's it's it is the, yes the enemy, but it's not the focus. So the second part of the retreat then is the illuminative way, walking with the Lord ever more deeply, learning to listen to Him also. And then the, the last section, which is two weeks long, uh, is the, the unitive way. So living with the Lord in such a way that, that, that he's your everything, that he's your everything, that he is sufficient for you, that even when crosses come your way, even they don't shake you because everything unites you to the Lord. It's, uh, I've never actually done the full spiritual exercises. Uh, I read bits and pieces on occasion, but I've never actually done them. Uh, but it, it does sound like a, a beautiful way of, of doing a retreat because I say half of the retreat is, is this unitive way that my heart belongs to the Lord and he, he's my everything. So Ign St. Ignatius recognizes this need to condense and refine and as such a structure spiritual direction and, and the spiritual journey uh, just to make sure we don't get lost along the way and to make sure that bar is held high. This, what, he, what he required of, of, of his uh, confreres was very high. They, 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 had, they, they had this kind of a ridiculous reputation, um, the, the Jesuits, that, that uh, if your superior asked you, asked you to murder someone, you'd have to do it, right? Um, just so fa so thorough was their obedience. Obviously, no superior would ever ask you to do it. And if they did, in conscience, you'd have to disobey. Long story, not getting into it, never happened. Um, but just so, such was their reputation for, for outright obedience. And when you look at the, like your Jean de Brebeuf and your Isaac Jogues, and that in, in uh, Canada, modern day New York, all around that area there, um, the, the, their obedience, their resilience, their courage, their love, absolutely phenomenal phenomenal why because they had already entered into this this unitive way where the lord was their everything the lord was their everything so saints saints are game changers saints are spiritual soldiers and when you look at the effect then of like padre pio known throughout the globe never left Foggia. Uh, you look at John Paul II did travel a fair bit, but we're still still drawing from his writings and will do, do so for an awful long time. I think the theology of the body is going to be discovered and rediscovered in, in future decades. You think of just the, the effect that St. Francis, St. Dominic, now St. Ignatius today, Mother Teresa, saints are game changers. And they are the, on the front lines fighting for souls. And what's incredible is that that battle continues here on earth, even after they've left. Even after that they're with us no longer, they continue fighting. It's phenomenal. When a heart belongs to the Lord, even after they're brought back up into heaven, their battle continues. They still continue fighting. You know, when a heart belongs to the Lord, it's, just, it's not bound anymore by the limitations of a human body. So just as we finish today, I'm going to read a prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the, the sushi pears it's called. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me, to you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen.